No, sir, young man, around here you can pause, exhale, check, recheck, think, peruse, contemplate, wade through, thumb over, dip in. Be my guest, folks. Thank you. We were thinking of maybe a little coop, something around $500, but as late a model as we can... Late? Late? You shocked me, you know You know your husband shocked me just then? Well, he was... Do you know why you shocked me? I'll tell you why he shocked me. It's because you've succumbed to the propaganda of every cement-headed plot up and down this street. I said propaganda. They like to push the late models, don't they? They do, don't they? You know why they push the late models? You think it's because they're honest, law-abiding, rigidly moral churchgoers? <laughs> Let me tell you something, young man. They push the... They push the late models because that is where the profit margin is. Well, we, they'll cram those post-54s down your gullet because they would rather make a buck than a friend. They would rather make a profit than a relationship. They would rather cram their wallets full of cash than fill their hearts with the fellowship of men to men. Well, we're really just looking for a good transportation car, and we thought the newer the car... <laughs> That's where you're completely going. That's where you've suddenly gone amiss. That's the juncture. It's headed you into a blind alley. You don't want a new car. You don't want one of those rinky dinks slapped together on an assembly line covered with chintzy chrome, fin tails, idiotic names, and no more workmanship than you can stick into a thimble. <laughs> I'll tell you what you want. You want the, the craftsmanship that comes with age, the dependability of proven performers, the, the dignity of traditional transportation. But this is what you want. It's past time to shelve the fantasies of limitless energy and the hubris that goes with them. We must start paying attention to the tools technologies and modest but real energy sources that can actually have a positive impact on human existence. In an age when only natural phenomena have gigawatts at their disposal anymore. Nowadays, a dozen large and small automakers are bringing out battery-powered cars of various kinds, ranging from compacts like the Ford Focus and Nissan Leaf to exotic items like the Aptera and the GEM. They range in price from high to astronomical, and all of them have their share of drawbacks, mostly in terms of range and reliability. But a significant number of people on the green end of things are hailing the appearance of these vehicles as a great step forward. Yeah, as things stand, that's a bit of an oversimplification. Most of the electricity these vehicles use will be generated by burning coal and natural gas. And the easy insistence that the grid can easily be switched over to solar and wind power won't stand up to close analysis. These points have been discussed to some extent in the alternative energy scene, but there are other points that deserve at least as much attention. From gas-powered cars to coal-powered electricity for cars. First of all, best way to reduce your ecological footprint isn't to replace a gasoline-fueled car with an electric car. It is to replace it with a bicycle, a, pub a public transit ticket or a good pair of shoes. Now. Of course, the built geography of much of rural and suburban North America makes it a little challenging to do without a car. But close to 100 million people in the United States live in places where a car is a luxury most or all of the time. For those Americans who actually do need a car, 
How about the new electric vehicles? Will they really decrease your carbon footprint and fossil fuel use as much as current verbiage claims? Well, the answer is no. First of all, or second of all, the vast majority of electricity in America and elsewhere comes from coal and natural gas. Choosing an electric car simply means that the carbon dioxide you generate comes out of a smokestack rather than a tailpipe. The internal combustion engine is an inefficient way of turning fuel into motion. About three quarters of the energy in a gallon of gas turns directly into low-grade heat and gets dumped into the atmosphere via the radiator, leaving only a quarter of the total to keep you rolling down the road. The processes of turning fossil fuel into heat and heat into electricity, storing the electricity in a battery and extracting it again and then turning the electricity into motion is less efficient still. So you're getting less of the original fossil fuel energy turned into distance travel than you would, you would in an ordinary car. Ordinary car, no. This means that you'd be burning more fossil fuel to power your electric car, even if the power plant was burning petroleum. Since coal and natural gas contain much less energy per unit of volume than petroleum distillates, your electric car is burning quite a bit of more fossil fuel and dumping quite a bit more carbon in the atmosphere than gasoline-powered cars do. The energy cost of manufacturing new cars. Now, this isn't something you'll see discussed very often in e-car websites or sales flyers. It's even less likely that you find any mention there of the second factor that needs to be discussed, which is the energy cost of manufacture. An automobile is a complex piece of hardware, and every part of it comes into being through a process that starts at an assortment of mines, oil wells and the like, and proceeds through refineries, factories, warehouses and assembly plants linked together by long supply chains. All this costs energy. Working out the exact energy cost per car would be an unimaginably huge project because it would involve tracking the energy used to produce and distribute every last screw, drop of solvent, etc. But it's safe to say that a, a very large portion of the total energy used in a car's lifespan is used up before the car reaches the dealer. Electric cars are just as subject to this rule as petroleum part ones. Promoters of the more grandiose end of alternative energy projects, that is, the solar power satellites and Nevada-sized farms that crop up so regularly when people are trying to ignore the reality of ecological limits, are particularly prone to brush aside the energy cost of manufacture with high-grade uh, high hand-waving. Factor in the energy cost of manufacture, and there's a straightforward answer to the question we've been just considering. If you really feel you have to have a car, what kind involves the smallest carbon footprint and the least overall energy use? Well, that's simple. I use one. Additional benefits to buying used compact cars. If you buy a used compact instead of a new electric car, you've just salvaged the energy cost of manufacture that went into the used car and saved all the energy that would have been spent to produce, ship and assemble every part of the new car. You also be producing less carbon dioxide than the 
share of a smokestack than would be needed to power an eco. Since it's a used compact, furthermore, it won't be tempted to drive it. You won't be tempted to drive it all over the place to show everyone you how ecologically conscious you are, thus saving another chunk of energy. Finally, of course, the price difference between a brand new Nissan Leaf and a used compact will buy you a solar water heating system, installation included, guaranteed that. With enough left over to completely weatherize an average American home. It's a win-win situation for everything but your ego. The private automobile is the ultimate poster child for the age of cheap, abundant energy. Hopelessly unsustainable without immense inputs of highly concentrated energy and vast and ongoing investments in infrastructure. What's the solution? Well, it's a simple one. Walking, bicycling, and public transit of various kinds are all options. And there are doubtless others. Thank you for listening.